password. So I'm going to push the button now. Um, so welcome to this session, Libraries as the Center of Virtual Reality Collaboration. I'm Jonathan Bradley. Um, let's jump through some of these slides. That was about the recording, which I've done. Uh, one of the founding partners of this, uh, Library 2.0, is the School of Information. So I want to acknowledge them. Um, yeah, we can do that. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and jump in because I've got um, a whole bunch of stuff to talk to you about. So um, I am the Assistant Director um, for Studios and Innovative Technologies here at the University Libraries um, at Virginia Tech. My title actually changed since I applied to this conference. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, how we've tried to build the libraries as a hub for that VR uh, collaboration on campus and what you can do to sort of work towards that as well. Um, so what are we going to talk about during this session? Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges of VR and why people might come to you as a library. Um, what the libraries need to do and how they can act as a hub for VR work. I'm going to talk some about the VR services that we have here at Virginia Tech um, and how we're sort of using those to go out into the community for K through 12 stuff and how we're sort of trying to be that hub. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so first question is, why is VR so hard? Um, if you don't know, VR is pretty heavily driven by the video games industry. Um, most of the technology is developed by people for video game purposes. Uh, and they require a very diverse set of skills. So any video game development usually has this listing plus more of sort of people working on it. So traditional artists, 3D artists, programmers, game designers, character designers, writers, voice actors, musicians, sound designers, a lot of people. And if you look at that list, you might notice that many of these people get paid a lot of money for what they do. And so education, which is always a little bit of star for funds, always has a little bit of trouble getting people to want to develop for them because there's not as much money here and making them cost so much money. It costs so much money to pay people to do this. Um, some of the other challenges, traditionally, especially in like academia, when a new technology comes out, I have what I call the lone idea person. Someone who says, sees a piece of technology and says, I have a really great idea for how that could be used. Um, and then they proceed to learn a little bit and then make something really great with it. But due to that diverse set of skills that are required with VR, it makes it very challenging for a single person to have all of the skills required to make their own educational VR experience. Um, and so that becomes a, a bit of a challenge um, for that person who's used to just doing something on their own. Um, distribution methods are a big difficult um, difficulty, which we've learned through our interactions with K through 12. Uh, most VR experiences that already exist get um, distributed through video game channels. Uh, many of those honestly aren't safe for work. Um, and we've had that trouble as we try to send our um, yeah, steam. Uh, we try to send our teachers and our collaborators to these places and say, you know, try to find something that's useful for your classroom. And it's it's just not a good method. It's also full of a bunch of stuff that's just not relevant to them. The alternative, like posting something on GitHub and distributing that way, also poses technical overhead. You have to know someone how to clone something from GitHub, how to install this application, and how to get it to work with the VR headsets that you have. And so the technical overhead also ends up posing big problems in these situations. Um, so then why do we bother doing this at all then? Um, the first one, and I'm gonna emphasize it a lot, is engagement. Um, through our research with the students at a local middle school who had access to VR, engagement is sort of through the roof. You put a VR headset on them and they're immediately engaged. That doesn't necessarily answer the question of whether or not they're learning something while they're engaged. That will be dependent upon the lesson, the VR experience, a number of factors that are ancillary to it. But engagement, which is one of the most challenging things to do in education, to get someone personally invested and excited about what they're doing, um, is hard. And you can overcome that pretty easily with VR. Um, a safe training analog, there's a lot of potential for giving people the opportunity to try something in a safe environment without necessarily, in the case of like medical stuff, putting someone's life at risk um, and or just training for a particular job that could be hazardous. We have um, people in our mining department who have developed training simulations in VR that are the difference between someone making it out of a mine alive or not. 
um, and they get to do it from the safety of you know the lab somewhere here at the building. Research potential. Um, there's a really great video from the Oculus developers about how they had to like re think fundamental problems about human vision that people weren't really concerned with because we didn't have a reason to be until VR became a thing. And now they're all of this research about human vision has sort of picked up and taken off again. Um, and that's sort of, you know, how easily the brain can be tricked in VR immersion and all these sorts of things. There's a lot of avenues that are research potential that are associated with that. And then finally, it's trendy. I have professors come out of the woodwork across the university who are like, I see my colleagues getting grants for VR. I know nothing about it. Can you help me? I think I'd like to try it out. It won't be trendy forever, um, but right now, if our goal is to help faculty members, teachers, people who are trying to get tenure or make a path towards education and meet some sort of goals that they're being handed down, we have to be ready to support them in whatever path they want to take. Um, so. All of that being said, what are a library's roles in all of this? Um, one thing, we are generally discipline agnostic. I learned a while back not to say neutral. Uh, that doesn't get a good reaction, but we are discipline agnostic in that our mission is usually to support uh, the community and the university as a whole. Um, we have a we are generally a trusted source for collaboration hopefully people are used to coming to us when they need to find collaborators they need to find connections in other areas um, we are all about knowledge distribution um, one of the things that i commonly say about library 2.0 what libraries are becoming is libraries have always been about access to knowledge we're still about that, that the form that knowledge takes might be slightly different, but now it's about access to more than that, equipment, to facilities, to space, all these sorts of things that also now sort of encompassed in what a library is and can be. Access to equipment is access, like it's an equity issue. A lot of times people don't have access to equipment and we can provide that the same way we used to provide and still do access to knowledge or books or something that people might not have had access to otherwise. Um, and it helps people get a leg up that they might have had trouble getting otherwise. Um, generally, libraries have broad expertise. We have a lot of different things that we're good at and areas that we can talk to people about. And so we offer something that like someone who's very heavily embedded in a single department may not have uh, that sort of knowledge. And we reach outside of academia. If you're a public institution, you're outside of academia to begin with, but even like Newman Library here on Tech's campus, in addition to being our academic library, is also a public library. We do public programming and the public can come in and use our spaces, and they regularly do. Um, so what does a library need to be one of these hubs? Um, expertise. Um, people come here, they need to know that someone here knows about this technology. Um, I will emphasize that sometimes you have to go outside of the field of library studies to find this. Um, I will say that me and my department, the people I oversee and who run the series of studios and do a lot of this work, none of us have degrees in library science. We're all from other fields. Uh, we have very diverse sets of degrees. And um, there's data scientists who work here. There's a lot of people who work at the library who are here to offer expertise, but are not necessarily here uh, from libraries. You might find somebody who has those skill sets and who has a library degree, but it can be very limiting on your searches for people and this sort of help if you sort of make that requirement on them. Um, you want to have a good working relationship with your departments and communities. If they, if people have a bad image of coming to you for help, then they're not going to come to you for help whenever they decide they want to take on a VR project. So they have to know you as a place where I go there and someone tries to find a way to help me to the best of their ability. Um, funding. for I am not going to sit up here and try to lie to you and tell you that this technology is not expensive. Um, it is. I do a lot of purchasing, so I know just how expensive it all is. Um, you have to have someone in your administration who is willing to support this idea and this collaboration. It may have to come from higher up in your administration. It definitely has to be within your library or you're not going to be able to make this happen very easily. Um, you got to have a willingness to say yes. Uh, so when someone comes to you with a project, you got to be there saying yes to them. Um, and you, but you also need to know how to balance that, I will say. So know what you're saying yes to and what you're willing to say yes to. So I often have people come to me 
and ask me to develop their project for them. And I say, no, let's, let's hire some students to develop your project and I will supervise them and oversee the work uh, because I don't have time to code five grant projects from various research faculty or um, in addition to the rest of my job. Um, visibility. If people don't know your service exists, they won't know to come ask for it. So you have to make it very widely available and visible to people so they know to come talk to you. Uh, and just generally excitement. Um, people, people know if you're just doing this because it's a facet of your job. If you're not excited about the technology or whoever they're interacting with isn't excited about it, then you aren't necessarily that hub, that place to go. And they're not the one, you're not the place that uh, they're going to tell their faculty members, their fellow um, researchers, oh, go to the library. They are super excited. They love that stuff over there and they're really helpful. Um, so all of that being said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our facilities here at Virginia Tech and um, how we're trying to make ourselves that hub on campus. Um, and so I'm going to talk about all of the following here. But before we go into that, I'm going to have a little bit of a caveat. So I'm going to talk to you about a lot of technology, a lot of services, a lot of uh, stuff that you may look at it and say, I could never do that. That's outside of my expertise. I don't have the funding to do that. Um, this is intended to show you sort of some options. And I would recommend you find in these things the things that you think you could do and you could pursue and start there. And the biggest thing that I've always found that's been particularly successful is start with something, show it can be a success, and then use that to advocate for more resources to do more. So figure out what you think is your sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, go for that and then use that to show the value to whoever makes financial decisions or staffing decisions or just general resource decisions. Um, but yes, I don't want you to get intimidated and say, I, there's no way we can do that. The program here at Tech has been well established. We have a lot of support from administration, both within the library and outside. Research on VR has been going on at Virginia Tech for like 20 years or something. So it's, it's not a, a difficult ask for us. Much It may be far more for you. So I don't want you to be discouraged by this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about spaces. Um, so the one we're going to talk about is the Virtual Environment Studio. It is a series of three spaces that exist here in Newman Library. They sort of roughly correspond to development, testing, and sort of more advanced research. Um, they, the reason we specifically have spaces in the building that are dedicated to this is because we found in talking with students that they often don't have the space it takes to do VR themselves in their apartments or their dorms or wherever it may be. And we did not want to exclude students from the potential hub that we're trying to build. So we dedicated spaces that they can come to. Um, the, we opened in the October of 2017. Um, the space is publicly accessible, which is actually an important factor. You do not have to be associated with Virginia Tech to come use these spaces. Uh, and we regularly have people who are not. Um, the spaces are staffed by student workers and a studio manager, that's me, uh, and a graduate assistant who act as support for the students when something is over their head or they can't help. Um, and finally, it houses our research program that we have here based in the libraries uh, called Applied Research in Immersive Experiences and Simulations, or ARIES for short, which is how I'll refer to it moving forward. Um, so these are the spaces. This is Newman 4010. This is a computer lab. Uh, it has development software, a very wide range of immersive environments, development software, everything from um, 3D scanning software to um, uh, 360 image um, processing software to you know, Unity and Unreal Engine and those sorts of things. Uh, we have headsets at some of the stations so you can sort of quickly test. There's also some on a cabinet on the other side of the room that you can't see. Um, there are individual stations are all bookable. So people can go on our website and they can book the individual stations that have listings of the software um, that exists in those. This also acts as the sort of de facto meeting space for ARIES, that research program. Um, Newman 4020, this is for room scale VR. Um, we have a dedicated space that's tracked. Uh, we have a very powerful PC um, that is for testing the projects. Um, or just learning. We have students who come in here and say, I know nothing about VR and I want to play a game. And we let them play a game. And that we also would argue is one of the fundamental parts of being a hub. 
you can't turn people away because they're not doing what you want them to do. You have to encourage them to play and try things out because I can't tell you how many times I've had a student who came in to play a game and then came back later and said, hey, do you think such and such is possible? I, I think I might like to try to do that for a class I have. So that initial play often turns into academic pursuit. Um, we have multiple headsets of different types. We have accessories like trackers and stuff that you can um, use to track various objects. Um, and this entire room is bookable via our website. Uh, and this is actually the first of the three spaces that we opened and has, is the one that has existed since 2017. Uh, finally, uh, Newman 2030. Uh, these three rooms are all right beside each other. This is our advanced research space. Um, we have another powerful headset in here and um, more advanced VR headsets, ones with eye tracking and uh, mixed reality built into them, things like that. We have a motion capture system in this room. We have mixed reality recording set up. There's a stereoscopic camera attached to the wall there. Uh, we're also in the process of building out the volumetric capture system we're trying to set up in here. Uh, and this entire room is bookable with mediation. So we don't want people to go in here and try to build something and then struggle with it for their entire booking and not know how. And so usually we meet with them, either my colleague, Todd Ogle, uh, who is in charge of the ARIES program or myself to talk with them about the technology and make sure they know sort of what they're doing or are gonna be able to sit down and really get involved. Um, so those are the three spaces. Um, there are some connected spaces that we have in the form of our other studios. These all contribute to the missions of that space um, in various ways. So we have a 3D scanning studio. We have some high-end 3D scanners where people can come make 3D models of objects and they often make them for use in a VR experience or an AR experience. Uh, we have the Fusion Studio, which is our student collaboration space. Um, so students who are working on a VR project can have a, a dedicated meeting a group space and then come use the virtual environment studio as they work on their projects. The media recording studio, which is our sort of professional recording space. Students come in here to record voiceovers and things like that. Uh, and finally, our newest space, which is the prototyping studio where people can build custom parts or things for virtual reality or augmented reality experiences. Um, and we've also been toying with the idea of letting them take apart some of our old headsets. Um, and I think we're going to get to move forward with that. I had to ask a lot of permissions at the university for taking hardware apart that the state bought for, but I think we might have a good plan for that now uh, and permission. So, um, so those are our spaces that are sort of dedicated to this that students can take advantage of. We also have equipment and this is uh, headed through the studio's technology lending desk. Um, this is the university's technology lending service. So we lend to everyone on campus regardless of departments. Some departments have their own individual uh, lending services, but this serves everyone. Um, among our sort of normal AV equipment that we check out, we also have standalone VR headsets, PC VR headsets. So they come in kits with high powered laptops that can run them. Uh, 360 cameras, microphones, AR headsets like Microsoft HoloLens, AR capable tablets, AR projectors, VR trackers. We actually just check out powerful PCs because the need for that is actually really impressive on campus, just having a PC that's capable of more than just like browsing the internet. General AV equipment and sort of random accessories for doing this sort of work, among a lot of other things like board games and some more fun things uh, involved in that. But this is how we let people take the research where they wanna go. And a lot of times we have someone develop something in one of our spaces and then they check out equipment to go do a presentation somewhere in a class or over in an art center or something along those lines. Um, we offer consultations. So um, I offer consultations on VR and AR development or 360 media capture. I do web programming, web development. Um, we have hardware customization, 3D design, among a sort of huge other grouping of things the library as a whole offers. Um, so these are how we make our first interaction with a lot of students and faculty. They come in for a consultation on a project they're working on or just to find their start. Um, we also do training and workshops. So this is a photo of me doing a, a training on some Arduino stuff. Um, it's primarily technology instruction that we're doing out of my unit. Um, so we teach people to use specific pieces of technology. I teach people to code in Unity. Um, all of our workshops are free and open to the public and we do have members of the public who attend those. 
Uh, we generally provide computers and whatever hardware is needed for the session um, because we find that people's laptops can't run Unity or whatever piece of software, and then it ends up becoming uh, a big issue for them, and they can't follow along with the workshop. Um, we can we also sometimes customize these classes for a class on campus and we go there and teach them and sort of tailor it for what they need. Uh, and we've started recording our workshops with the intention of publicly distributing them because asynchronous education is is now something that we're much more aware of and has become a bigger part of um, our focus and our mission. Um, so um, beyond those, we also offer assistantships and internships. Um, so I have a graduate assistant um, who works out of the virtual environment studio. Uh, he teaches workshops, he takes consultations, uh, he also helps sort of manage the studio um, and has gotten a lot of experience. He never taught anything before and now he's taught dozens of workshops and is quite honestly a great teacher. He's got experience that he probably never would have gotten at school otherwise had he not worked for us. Um, and we also have an internship program. Um, so this is a great opportunity for you to bring uh, departments that don't normally interact with VR in. So we have a technical writer intern who makes documentation for our VR stuff. So I actually included a screen capture of an FAQ that she's made for the studio. Um, we have marketing interns who come and learn how to promote VR and often involves learning a little bit about the technology. Uh, and we're potentially looking at some other ways of bringing some internships into the building. Um, yeah, so community outreach. Um, so I wanna jump in on this. There's a lot of different ways that this being a hub brings people in. So we've got local school systems, local museums and other local libraries. I've gone and done VR demonstrations, presentations for our public library systems. Uh, and local businesses often reach out to us because they need to know something related to VR, AR development, and they just don't have the resources. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple examples. This photo I will talk about. This, These are all teachers from our local middle school who came to campus to learn Unity from me. Um, so I taught a class on Unity, and they bust over their students as they were building um, their own lab. So this is the first example, the Blacksburg Middle School Lab. Um, so we partnered in 2018 with Blacksburg Middle School to build a VR lab in the school. Um, we trained teachers, which I just mentioned. We funded stipends so that they could make lesson plans. Um, we purchased some hardware and infrastructure through a grant. Um, and this partnership has led other schools to reaching out for us and us being able to do more community outreach. And they're actually expanding this project. They built a second lab and they're looking at getting some standalone VR headsets as well. Um, another one that's sort of fun, that's a photo of me up on the side of a really big train. Um, we bought, brought uh, 360 camera equipment to the Virginia Museum of Transportation so that we could take some 360 photos of some of their trains, especially one in particular that was getting ready to leave the museum for a long time. Um, for them to use on social media. And they just reached out to us because they had seen something else we were doing related to VR. And so we were like, sure, we'll drive up there um, and take some 360 photos. Um, this also ends up leading to a lot of grants. Um, so this uh, screen capture is from the Virtual Sculpture Garden. It's a WebXR experience that we developed in-house here at the University Libraries um, as part of a grant that one of my colleagues got. Um, for grants, we often act in a supervisory role, which I mentioned. So I supervise students who are developing things so that they get the experience and I'm not, it's not all of my time spent like doing all this development. Uh, we also offer to provide training on grants. Um, we provide facilities and resources to various faculty members on campus who are trying to get grants and I often write letters of support for them. Um, and these can sometimes be internal projects or external. So sometimes these are library projects that we've taken on and gotten grants for. And sometimes they're grants that somebody got for NSF or something like that. And we're just involved with helping facilitate that using these resources, using the knowledge and training and expertise that we have. Um, so I mentioned the virtual sculpture garden. We also have Telio Crater. Uh, we've been scanning uh, unique dinosaur bones that uh, one of our uh, paleontologists have, and we're building an AR experience for use in classrooms uh, based on that. So a uh, very quick summary, because I want to make sure we have time. You need to make sure that if you're going to be one of these hubs, you have the expertise. If someone comes to you and you just sort of give them something and say, good luck, then it makes it really challenging. I can't tell you how many teachers have come to me and said, yeah, we have that equipment in my school, but nobody uses it because nobody knows how. 
um, the service has to be visible. If people don't know you have it, they won't ask you to help them. Um, I say try to avoid the field of dream situation. If you build it, they won't necessarily come. You have to provide the support around it that acts as that entrance into um, your, your services. You have to be willing to say yes to projects. Um, a lot of times you will get a ton of projects and you've got to figure out what you can say yes to and what, how much time you have to do this. Um, and your administration has to be willing to support your outreach efforts and, and funding in general. Um, if you don't have support from administration, this is expensive and it can be time consuming. Like I go over to Blacksburg Middle School for like a day and I help them build things and that's time I'm not here in this library. So your administration has to be supportive of that. And mine is, and, but if you don't have that support, it becomes very challenging. So um, I will stop there and let us have some questions. Yeah, Carrie, you've the moderator, you've got your hand up. Uh, you need me to unmute you. Uh, let me do that. Uh, I think. Oh. Where are you in the listing? Because uh, I think I've muted everybody. Uh, there you are. I found you. Uh, unmute. Hi, um, it's up to you how you want to handle questions. I wrote down the ones that were in the chat, or if you want the people to ask you themselves, whatever you want. Uh, let's go through the chat so we can, I can get through as many as I can. Uh, can I ask what your total annual budget is? Um, for So a lot of our technology purchases come off of ETF funds, which are a thing here in the state of Virginia that we are um, given to buy specifically technology that is expensive. Um, and so there's that pot of money, which changes for me every year. My actual budget for running these spaces, the, just the virtual environment studio portion is like $19,000 and it's primarily wage for internships and student workers. Um, and the rest of the money is just, um, a lot of it's coming down to those technology funds and things like that. And the other studios and the other spaces that I manage have, they have their own budgets and stuff. Um, and those vary based on how much student staffing they have. Most of our money goes to wage. Um, we're looking at handheld 3D scanners, uh, recommendations for first time users. Um, the ones we use are, are very expensive and I don't know that I would recommend them. Um, there is one brand, I think it's Peel, um, that has a pretty good scanner that comes in at about, it depends on what your budget is, it comes in at like $5,000. Um, and it's a pretty good entry level, less than that. And you, your scans are sort of middle ground. But if you want to do it on the cheap, I recommend photogrammetry and Alice Vision. Um, so if you do Mesh Lab, um, it's amazing for photogrammetry and it basically costs you nothing. You can do it with your phone. And I, I teach a workshop on that and that gets a lot of people in because they don't have to buy the expensive like 3D scanner. Uh, you need to be able to make a demo this hands on for those in charge. A lot of people have not had experience using VR. Once they experience technology, they will be converted. It is very true. I usually have someone put a headset on and they're immediately like, I had no idea. This is what it like. They thought they knew what VR is and then they try the headset and it immediately, their perception has changed. Um, spell that please. It's P E E L E. I think is the brand name, uh, for the 3d scanner. Um, I wonder if I can get our local colleges to invest. They have way more money in my small library system. Yeah, like we've had local libraries reach out to us and I'm generally always happy to go like help and talk with them. And I've held, I held an event for, you know, their local patrons to come in and try VR headsets and stuff. Um, so it's not a bad idea. A lot of us are looking for ways to do outreach and um, it's, it's nice when it comes to you because then you sort of have that pressure to do it versus trying to get everything else in your job. Um, let's see, most teachers, uni has an excellent ed program. Yeah, so the expertise thing that I mentioned, um, I, uh, I had to learn Unity. When I first started here, I didn't know Unity development, but I was getting a lot of demand for teaching it. So I got the Unity Ed classes that then you like could pay for like a certification process. And I just went through that to learn it because I needed to know how to do that for the, the classes that we were getting demand for. And so it does require a little bit more out of you in terms of learning, you know, your own thing uh, in order to do that. 
but it's 5.30 now. There were a lot of questions. I'm sorry to anyone I didn't get to. Um, I got my email address up on the screen right now. If you want um, to send me an email, I'm happy to answer any of the questions that you might have. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming out and I don't, I want you to be able to go to the next session because there's a lot of great stuff at this conference. Bye.